Not before we get the insight on exactly what is going on as the winter meetings continue down in San Diego and the great Buster Olney of ESPN hops on to talk it all out. Buster, busy week. Glad to have you. What's going on, man? Yeah, it was uh, a crazy week uh, of moves, and there's still some big moves to happen. But, man, <laughs> just when you look at the total tab that teams have uh, run up with these contracts with players, pretty amazing, and it really tells you that sport's in a good place. Yeah, I mean, we want to get to that on a, on a bunch of fronts. It's really been breathtaking, everyone getting paid till they're 40. But we want to hop right to what is big and in the moment. What's the Carlos Correa market? What's the likelihood of Giants? What's the timing? So from what I understand, um, the Giants haven't really gotten too deeply into the Correa conversations yet in terms of dollars. You know, they met with Correa uh, down in San Diego. You know, Scott Boris represents him. They, you know, had teams going through his suite. Um, you know, they're, the teams that we've talked about so much are the Cubs. You know, the Twins with Carlos last year, they won him back. The Red Sox, in theory, would have a, you know, a spot for a shortstop. The team I'm watching at the moment, the Yankees, because I'm definitely picking up a lot of vibes there that, yeah, they signed Aaron Judge to that $360 million deal, but they're working on something big. And I wish I could tell you exactly what that was, but, I mean, Carlos Correa, let's face it, that would be uh, among the available free agents. That would be the biggest way to go. And we know that uh, Hal Steinbrenner, the Yankees owner, you know, met twice with, with Judge in Tampa, spoke with him to finish the deal the other day. And he essentially, in so many words, you know, told him that they were going to do everything they could to win. This is total speculation on my part. I don't have, have that confirmed, but I just know they're working on something big, and maybe it's Carlos. That would be a gut punch, number oh. two. A second gut punch for the Giants to miss out on Judge and Correa and have them both land with the Yankees. How desperate are the Giants feeling in terms of not only getting Correa, but potentially landing somebody else near the top of the free agent list? Yeah, I, I, when, you know, I've had conversations with folks uh, you know, in the last 48 hours about that with the Giants, and I didn't get a, a, you know, a sense of desperation per se. Um, I, in fact, I had a, a sense, more of a sense of, because the conversation, one of them was about Aaron Judge, it was more of a sense of resignation. I can tell you that even when the, the Giants planned to make this run and they were talking about it internally in the middle of the summer, they thought it was a long shot. Um, and, and, you know, I, I really think it came down to whether or not the Yankees came out from behind their bunker with a white flag with Judge and said, okay, you're right, we're wrong, we'll give you whatever you want. If the, if the Giants had separated themselves, say, you know, they were 360 and the Yankees had offered 250, 280, I, I think Judge would have gone to the Giants. Hmm. Um, but what I got back the other day was they really enjoyed the meeting with Judge last week. They thought he was earnest. And I, I absolutely, knowing him too, I, I think he was. But I think where the numbers fell with the Yankees, if the if the Giants were to actually have a shot, I think they would have had to offer four hundred fifty million north of that. They would have had to separate themselves in a big way in order to coax him, uh, you know, coax him uh, out of out of New York. Buster only with us here on Withered and Dibs. You use the word resignation in talking with the Giants. Uh, here, here's my question, Buster. I'm I, I would I would think they know this, but. They, they've they talked for so long about having the finances to get in the game with any conversation, wanting to adjust their philosophy to really be a factor at the top of the market. Because they've said that publicly and because they were boring and 500 and disappointing last year, do you also get the sense when you talk to them, I'm scared of the word resignation because – do you think that they understand that if they simply come home from this offseason with Mitch Haniger, they're looking at a livid fan base? And, and I would agree with you. Um, I, I would say this, you know, and I have not had this discussion with Farhan, uh, you know, directly, but, I, I, you know, my conversation with him would, have, would probably be around, hey, look what, you know, look who's landing the elite players in this market, the players that, you know, can be the face of the franchise. The Yankees' offer in spring training was 213 and a half. They increased that by 70%. Uh, you know, the, the Philadelphia Phillies, 
offered Trey Turner $300 million. The Padres shocked the baseball world by offering Bogart three times what the Red Sox offered him in the spring. So I think if I had a, you know, sat down for lunch with Farhan, I'd say, boy, the one thing that's pretty clear this winter, if you're going to sign one of those face of the franchise guys, you're going to have to make a deal that's really, really uncomfortable. You're going to have to give them a number that you wouldn't have imagined six months ago giving them. Because guess what? That's who's getting these guys. You're not getting these guys with a, you know, a deal where it feels like it's market friendly or you, know, you outsmart the other teams. You have to go to a place that probably makes you lose sleep at night. Um, and until they do that, you know, and if their their hope is to get Correa, uh, I, I suspect, given the fact that, I mean, think about this. The Padres, before they signed Xander Bogarts, they offered Trey Turner the biggest contract for any shortstop in the history of the game, $342 million. And this is someone who's not considered to be a good defender. And so if you're Scott Boris, you're seeing the trends in the market, you represent Correa, you're thinking you got a shot at $400 million, okay? And that would be the sort of number that would make baseball executives, it would have made them six months ago, uh, you know, shake and, and shudder. But that's where we are. And if you're the Giants, you got to start thinking about that number. If you're the, you know, the Red Sox, and you want to make up for some of your mistakes, you got to think about that number. Um, you know, I, I don't, you know, and those to me are the right now the two big guys in the marketplace with uh, Dansby Swanson being another one. But I think Dansby's going to be a lot less expensive than Correa. And do you think Dansby goes first? I know they're both Boris clients, but is there the sense that Correa wants to be the fourth of the big four shortstops to go and thus have his market go even higher than it already astronomically is? Well, not to be Captain uh, you know, nitpick, um, Dansby's represented by XL. Uh, Casey Close is different than Boris. Ah, sorry. But, you know, Dans- Dansby, uh, you know, he may go on his own trajectory because he, of course, has the offer in hand from the Atlanta Braves. Um, I, I, I've been watching the Chicago Cubs. I think he fits what they're trying to do, which is to build a really good defensive team. You know, that's why they signed Cody Bellinger, who's a good defender in center field. Nico Horner, you know, if they signed a shortstop, would slide over to second. That would be an awesome middle of the infield. Um, you know, and I do wonder about the Red Sox, who are just getting hammered in their home market uh, by their fan base over the departure of Betts a few years ago and now Bogart. Um, I... I I don't think that they're related. I think that in the case of Correa, Boris is going to market him um, much in the same way. Remember, you know, the way he's done Harp. He did Bryce Harper in the past, where if he has to wait uh, and wait and wait for a desperate owner to meet his price, I think he's going to do that. And I'm guessing that this week's, um, you know, this week's movement probably will embolden him. And on top of that, in this game of shortstop musical chairs. Guys, there, there are more buyers than there are, are elite shortstops. There are two elite guys left on the board, and there are about four or five teams that could use that player. Buster only with us here, Willard and Dibbs, 95-7 the game. Buster, what's going on with Carlos Rodon? How does this play out? Yeah, the Yankees are involved in that. Uh, I think now that the Mets have blown through the, uh, the luxury tax threshold uh, led by the richest owner of baseball, Steve Cohen, I don't think we can rule them out either. Um, you know, one of the... <laughs> You know, the Mets have always been a, a big market team that conducted their business like a mid market team. Well, that changed when Steve Cohen bought the club. We've never seen a full on uh, bidding war between the Mets and the Yankees over a player. We might actually be in the midst of one with Rodon. Uh, you know, he's looking for a six year deal. He's, I, I think, going to be in a great position to get that. Uh, because he's far and away the best available guy on the board. Chris Bassett, I think, is also going to do really well. So if the Giants don't get Correa and Rodon already opted out, so he's likely not coming there, to where does Farhan Zaidi pivot? A lot of pieces and parts, um, which is, you know, we saw the hmm. Giants last year. That's what they were. Uh, you know, in the first year with that Buster Posey with Brandon Crawford having a down year uh, injury with a lot of injuries, Brandon Belt having a down year. Because that's probably you know what's left, and I and I'm just speculating here. You know, is Bassett going to be that guy because he's less expensive? Uh, you know, could you go and out and get the the guy who hammered left-handed pitching in an AJ Pollock? Uh, and I know that's not going to be as satisfying, and I don't think there's any doubt that it it wouldn't satisfy 
uh, you know, the biggest desire, I think, within the organization, which is to get a guy that could be the face of the franchise going forward. You know, when we had a Sunday night baseball game with the Giants this year in preparing for that, Eduardo Perez, you know, asked the rest of us in a Zoom call, uh, whose jersey is a 10 year old fan buying right now in this roster? Mm-hmm. And I think that's a, that's a question that hasn't been answered yet. And, and, and maybe, you know, at some point this winter, if the Giants don't get one of these big fish that are remaining on the market, uh, you know, Correa certainly would be that guy if they can land him. But if they don't get him or, uh, you know, another big name in a trade, then I think a lot of teams will start to think about two names. Shohei Otani, who I don't think there's any doubt he's going to be a free agent next fall. And then there's Rafael Devers, uh, who is now in a position of incredible leverage in his talks with the Red Sox. He may follow Betts and Bogarts out the door. Buster, fair or foul that this has become sort of a, a characteristic of the Giants in the minds of fans because they've tried – uh, they they finished in second place on so many big names. Judge, Harper, go back to John Carlos Stanton. Why don't players, offensive players, seem like they want to come to San Francisco? Well, maybe it's that, you know, the feeling of, uh, and I'm, you know, I haven't had players say this to me, but the, it does have a reputation as being a place where uh, you don't want to go because the, the offensive numbers can be depressed, uh, which is interesting, of course, because the greatest offensive player we've ever seen played with the Giants <laughs> in that ball. Right. Um, and, you know, and I think that when teams are in that position, they don't have much choice other than to uh, outspend that perception. We're seeing the Padres do that. You know, we're seeing. This winter, Peter Seidler, their owner, basically is selling these free agents like Turner and then Judge, and then he finally landed Bogarts. Uh, look, we're going to do whatever it takes. And suddenly you have the Padres with a roster with Machado and Juan Soto and uh, you know Fernando Tatis Jr. and, and now Xander Bogarts. I think that's what it's going to take in this current marketplace. If you want to get one of those guys, you got to go to a place that uh, makes you cringe. I tell you what, uh, a lot of fans are going to cringe if the Giants don't go to that place. So uh, that that's kind of that's kind of what we're looking at, Buster. Uh, I know it's such a busy time. We really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks, Buster. Absolutely, guys. And again, I I, don't, I didn't mean to be nitpicky there, but I no, I, I appreciate, I appreciate you being Captain Nitpick, and uh, <laughs> you, you put me in my place, and you ruined Giants fans' weekend with the expression "pieces and parts." Yeah, I, oh, I, I, well, well, let's hope for better. Yeah, let's. Yeah, let's. let's. <laughs> Thanks, Sounds Buster. like they're all going to be Yankees, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Buster. Um, Damn Yankees. Yeah, I, it, 